Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Assure Holdings Investor Webinar. Assure is listed on the TSX Venture Exchange with the ticker IOM and on the OTC with the ticker ARHH. The company works with surgeons to provide turnkey solutions and, and services that support interoperative neuromonitoring activities during invasive surgeries. John Farlinger, CEO of Assure, will take us through the presentation followed by a question and answer period. As always, if you have any questions, you can input them into the Q&A box below. Um, before we begin, I'll note that the presentation may contain some forward-looking information. You can view those disclaimers on the uh, presentation and on the company website. Hi, John. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Tina. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Farlinger. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Sure Holdings Corporation. Uh, we're a publicly traded healthcare services company trading on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol IOM and on the OTCQB under the symbol ARHH. I'm just going to jump right to the slide, go through a quick presentation, and then open it up uh, to Q&A. Jumping on to slide three is a quick overview of the business. And we are, uh, we are in the business of providing outsourced interoperative neuro neurophysiological monitoring services. We're the only publicly traded company of our type. And we have just recently added telehealth services to our offering. And we're currently offering professional neurology services related initially to interoperative neuromonitoring, but quickly migrating into other services as we start to scale the business. We currently operate in 10 states. We did just under 10,000 managed procedures last year. We work with 191 surgeons in 127 facilities, and we employ over 80 revenue generating technologists. Uh, we're a recipient of the Joint Commission Award, which recognizes the highest levels of service in hospital settings. And we, we were awarded that recognition about a year and a half ago and it reflects the commitment to quality of service that we have. You see a quick chart on the bottom of the uh, slide, which shows you our growth rate in procedures from 2017, really through 2020, where we had over an 80% growth rate uh, through those years. This year, we are forecasting to grow from just under 10,000 procedures last year to over 17,000 procedures in 2021. Uh, a procedure drives multiple revenue streams from us, really technologist revenue and neurologist revenue. And I'll show you those streams and slides that are coming up here shortly. Corporate objectives for us in 2021, there were four. If you listen to any of our earnings calls, you'll hear me like a broken record talking about these. Firstly, uh, it's all about scale and increasing the size of our business. Uh, we want to increase the number of procedures this year by 70%. We want to continue to grow organically by opening up new states. We have a dedicated sales team of four people that are constantly working on that. We want to continue to pursue M&A opportunities. And as the only publicly traded company of our type in this vertical, we see a tremendous opportunity to be a consolidator and to go after the literally dozens of competitors that we have and on a fairly fragmented basis across the United States. As I spoke about, we're in the process of launching and scaling our own neurologist telemedicine platform. And we are going after hospital contracts now in an attempt to induce them to use our services really as an outsource provider of interoperative neuromonitoring services. As the company's grown uh, from when it went public in 2017, Initially, it had significant issues with collections, out-of-network billing. We have focused and made that really a weakness and turned it into a strength, where we are focused on really improving cash collections and in-network agreements. And what in-network agreements and contracting means is that we are partnering with the insurance companies and striking deals where we will be paid a rate on every procedure. Uh, we're further using data and analytics and automation to improve that position. 18 months ago, 24 months ago, we were using third-party billing companies that were giving us paper reports. We had no insight into the value of the data, the data itself. 
And over the last 18 months, we have moved to fully automate our platform. And now we're using data, analytics, bots. And I think right now we're in a position we can compete with anybody in this industry. Uh, we've hired outstanding management to drive that process on the in-network contracting side and the cash collection side. Our goal by the end of 2021 is to have 50% of our volume in in-network contracts. And by next year, to be in a position at the end of 2022, to have a deal with every major payor where it makes sense. Uh, and if it doesn't, then we'll continue to deploy out of network billing practices with them. From a cash collection standpoint, again, I'll, 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 I'll say it again, we have built a tremendous team here. Over the last 18 months, really since early 2020, we made the decision to bring this in-house. We now employ about 25 people. We hired a, an RCM vice president who was managing 800 million of revenue cycle billing with a PE-backed healthcare services company. We are focusing on automation and we are gonna make a significant investment in that because we really believe it's a significant differentiator for us going forward. Last year, we improved our cash collection numbers by 50% in bringing it in-house, uh, bringing total collections from 16 million in 2019 to over 24 million in 2020. That took us to cash low break even and it will be a key driver for us in the second half of this year. Lastly, our mantra is all about clinical excellence. And the reason we have been so successful in taking business away from our competitors when many of them aren't growing and we're growing at 80% is that we are outstanding and we focus on clinical excellence. Uh, we have set up our own education program. We've hired a, an education director who's taught at Harvard, the University of Chicago, and we are bringing on our own recruits directly now out of schools like the University of Michigan, the University of Connecticut, and training them on the way that we want them to be trained. And we are becoming a recognized leader in clinical research. We're partnering with Texas Back Institute, one of the preeminent spine surgery groups in the United States, and we're working on training and research. This data becomes critical as we go out and continue to evangelize our services because we're taking data that we are currently generating data that we're using for our payors and we're giving it back to them and showing how valuable we are in the operating room in performing surgeries. Other points of interest in terms of objectives are we had really stated an objective this year was to uplist. Uh, we, we filed an S1 registration statement with the SEC uh, in December of last year. It was approved in February. We're now an SEC filer and we have made an application with NASDAQ. We received comments back over the last week and we'll be attempting to clear those comments. I know a number of you are wondering what that timeline looks like. Uh, I can't give you an exact date, but I can tell you it's a priority for us to uplist over the summer. And it will simply come down to the speed at which we can clear comments uh, with NASDAQ. But we're excited about doing this and uplisting, up really uplisting from the TSX fee and the OTCQB onto a major US exchange going forward. For those of you that don't know much about interoperative neural monitoring, uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's technically, it's the use of electrophysiological methods, usually characterized as EEG and EMG, to observe the functional integrity of neural structures during complicated surgeries. You're not doing this for a simple elbow replacement or a, a fairly superficial surgery. We're doing complicated and highly invasive surgeries. Uh, we're providing immediate feedback and warning to a surgeon before the occurrence of a neurological deficit during a surgery. We're trying to stop a permanent injury or a fatality from happening during a surgery. We're looking at up to 16 different modalities and we can gauge up to 32 depending upon the surgery. We're looking at the effects of neural activity. We're looking at the impact of the scalpel on the surgery. We're looking at the impact of anesthetics. And our tech in the operating room is working closely with a neurologist who is typically working remote, working closely with the surgeon during that surgery. When are we doing it? During spine and neural surgeries, vascular, ENT, orthopedic, and any other type of invasive surgery. Last year in the United States, over 1.4 million surgeries took place using this type of service. 
uh, the market has been predominantly controlled by or predominantly focused on spine and orthopedic. An ever-increasing number of neurosurgeries, ENT and vascular surgeons are adopting this as a best practice. We're heavily focused now on the ENT and vascular markets. A quick pectoral shows how we make money. And this is kind of the money slide for us. In blue, you see the operating room environment and you, in orange, you see the offsite environment. In blue, you see a surgeon working on a patient who's face down on a table. This is a typical spine or back surgery. The pa patient is connected via pins, wires, to a computer screen, which is a CAD well machine, which our technologist is reviewing. And they are looking at the modalities that I spoke about earlier. They're providing and communicating with a, a neurologist who is working remotely. Currently, that neurologist is a contracted, co is a contractor or working for a contracting company. This is the really the standard of care now in the United States. Rather than putting a neurologist into every operating room, the more practical solution is to have them working remotely in a telehealth environment. So essentially, they're looking at the same data that our tech is, they're communicating and chatting directly with the surgeon. In some cases in the OR, the doctor will be looking at the same data on a large screen. In our model, we are billing and collecting for the services provided by our technologist. And in our model, we believe we have some competitive advantages as it relates to the technologist. For the neurologist, our model is somewhat unique in that we share that revenue with our surgeon partners where we set up a partnership with them. To date, uh, in this model, we have been paying contractors who in many cases are looking at seven to 12 procedures at a time. In our world now, we are going to do that ourselves and to make additional margin by bringing that in-house and we believe will generate a 50% plus margin going forward. And, and it appears a little bit, it is complicated, but in our world, we are essentially billing for the professional services through a partnership with the surgeons we're retaining a neurologist group to do the work, and then we're sharing that net profit with our surgeon partners. Going forward, as we do the work ourselves, that will be net new revenue for us. And our plan really is to migrate upwards of 20,000 procedures onto our own platform over the next 12 to 24 months, generating on average five to $600 per procedure with about a 50% gross margin. The model that we, or the, the environment that we work in is really a complicated environment. Uh, and the ecosystem is primarily made up of surgeons, hospitals, insurance companies, and the patients themselves. And like any business, we have to meet the needs of those various uh, cohabitants in, in our ecosystem. Firstly, with the surgeons, uh, we're clearly meeting a need that they have. We've grown from zero to working with nearly 200 surgeons in 10 states. And these are not, and these are typically neurosurgeons, spine, orthopedic, back, ENT, vascular. They're very successful and they're migrating to our platform for a reason. One of the problems they have is that in going into a complicated invasive surgery, they want trust, they want continuity, they want to know who the team, what the team looks like before they go into a complicated operation. In our model, our tech, works with that doctor or group of surgeons on every case, every procedure. There's an element of trust, there's continuity. And we try to match our techs who require specific training based upon the vertical with a surgeon. If the surgeon's not using us, he's typically relying on the hospital to parachute somebody in, a staffing company, et cetera. There is not continuity, there's a lack of trust, and it's not ideal for surgeons. And I think, you know, obviously, Surgeons like trust, they like continuity. That's been a clear driver for us. The other factor really with that is we do a rev share uh, where we can, the surgeon can make additional money from us as we set up partnerships to handle neurologist revenue. Other partners of the ecosystem, the hospitals, we're going after hospital business now in an attempt to induce them to outsource to us. Neuromonitoring or interoperative neuromonitoring is not a core competency for most hospitals. And in fact, with the recent COVID pandemic, 
many hospitals have tried to divest of as many costs as possible. As we move forward, a key part of our business will be going out, evangelizing our services and inducing the hospitals to outsource to us. In addition, we want them to look at our neurologist services, which we will be providing remotely. And we believe there's a strong fit for what we're doing and smaller regional hospitals, which will not want to carry the costs of additional neurologists. With respect to the insurance companies, uh, they provide us with most of our revenue. And so we've got to be very cognizant of their needs. Our model is unique versus everybody else in the industry who are billing out of network, which means they don't have a contract with the insurance company. They'll provide the service and they'll hope to get paid what they want five, six, seven, nine, sometimes 12, 18 months later. We feel the better opportunity is to partner with the insurance companies, clearly explain the value proposition and get into contracts and multi-year contracts with them. And uh, we've been pretty successful at it. Uh, one, of our one of our VPs, Paul Webster, helped grow a company called Air Methods in the United States and was responsible for driving. Air Methods grew from a market cap of a few hundred million to a $2.3 billion exit. A key part of their growth strategy was to drive a significant portion of their revenue into in-network agreements. That's what Paul does for us. He's been doing it for over a decade and he's very good at it. And a key part of his strategy is now in understanding margins, pricing, and going in network. Lastly, are the patients themselves. Listen, that's what our business is all about. It's improving quality of life during complex and invasive surgeries. And we're working with patients prior to the day of surgery and post-surgery. We have a team of people, our patient advocates, who really help patients understand the surgery process and they guide them through it every step of the way. Uh, with respect to our, our meeting the needs of the patients, uh, all of our technologists are board certified, which means not only do they have an undergrad or master's degree, they have passed a board certification process and they've got to complete well over 150 surgeries to do that. And so a big part of what we're doing here is really focused around the patient and making their lives simpler and easier during what can be a fairly, uh, a fairly invasive surgery. And obviously they're very stressful for most patients. Growth trends in the industry, um, we're obviously going through a growth phase. You've got an increasing number of surgeries, an increasing number of chronic disorders, and the tailwinds for that are not gonna change. The outsourced market, which we compete in, is just under a billion dollars. Uh, the market is approximately 880 million, growing at a 10% CAGR, it'll be over 1.1 billion by 2022. The insource market, which represents hospitals and people working inside the facilities, is roughly about eight, 850 million, and it's gonna grow to about a billion. So you've got a total market here of about 2 billion. And uh, we see continuing to benefit from the growth of this industry. Um, we don't see that changing. What the other key factors here is you, you see, I'm gonna jump onto a slide here, which is a competitive landscape. And the, the key factors here are that it's highly fragmented. On this slide, you see the competitive landscape. You see us on the top left. Sure, we did about 10,000 procedures last year. On the horizontal axis going across the top of the page, you see what we do. Uh, we have a dedicated technologist or interoperative neuromonitoring specific. We provide professional oversight on all of our cases, which means we have a neurologist on every procedure we do. All of our technologists are board certified, which hardly any of our competitors can, can boast that. There are less than 6,000 certified interoperative neuromonitoring technologists in the United States. We employ over 80 of them. We have an in-house patient advocate team. We provide, are now providing now neurologist telehealth services, and we clearly provide cost savings to the facilities. And we, we can demonstrate that on every bid that we put forward now. As we look at the market, a couple of direct competitors are Medsurant and National. Medsurant works out of the Pennsylvania market, private equity backed. They did about 40,000 procedures last year. National Neuro out of Dallas, sorry, out of the Texas market, did about 30,000. 
And then you've got about a half a million procedures that are highly fragmented, dozens and dozens of competitors across multiple states, all facing the same challenges of billing, lack of capitalization, in many cases, lacking management sophistication to grow their business. The hospitals themselves do over 600,000 procedures. And then you've got two dominant players in new base of specialty care, a uh, new base of a multi-billion, multi-billion dollar entity providing everything from medical devices to uh, supplies and services to the hospital. Specialty care, a PE back uh, company, starting with blood perfusion. Now, 35% of their revenue is focused around interoperative neuromonitoring. They have about a 10% market share each. We're, we believe we can grow our business this year from 10 to 17, 18,000 procedures. Quickly, we are getting into that top five, top, top six in the business, but we have plans of getting much larger and we believe we will based upon the strengths that we're building. As you look at the United States and the map, and to date we are, we are limited to the domestic United States. We currently operate in 10 states there in green, started in Colorado. Uh, we've had business in Utah, Arizona just recently, Texas, Kansas, Missouri. Kansas, Missouri, really through our recent acquisition of Century, Louisiana, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina. Questions are probably gonna be where are we going next? We're looking very closely at Nevada, Nebraska, Minnesota, uh, New Jersey, and Alabama as potential growth states in the very near future. What drives geographical growth, we're not gonna go into a new state unless we have commercial opportunities and contracts with potential hospitals or certain groups of surgeons to, to really warrant the investment spending into a new market. The other thing that we're doing is we're also growing in our current states. Uh, it's much more profitable for us to grow in a market where we currently have infrastructure and staff and scale. And so we're also doing that. But the other things that are gonna drive growth for us are really two or three things. Uh, M&A, it's gonna be a, a meaningful part of our growth. We're looking, we did. We just announced one transaction, which I'll talk about in the slide coming up, but all of our competitors, at least the competitors that are doing less than 10,000 procedures have common problems. They're lacking capital. They don't have the ability to, to do RCM and collect money. And uh, they are lacking management expertise. We see a huge opportunity to grow by continued M&A. We've also set up a model where we are enticing orthopedic and spine distributors to bring their doctors onto our platform. And we started an online outreach campaign. I think we've signed about 10 distributors now, and we're in negotiations with two large distributors that could bring multi-state expansion to our business. Uh, We see that as a significant driver for us over the balance of this year and next year. And lastly, we're going after the hospitals and the facilities themselves. We see as we launch our services and grow and scale they can benefit from our scale. In nearly every case, they're losing money. By coming onto our platform, we can give them a rev share and cut that loss almost immediately. And as we start to scale telehealth, that will be an offering that will be part of our menu as we go to the hospitals to induce them to outsource to us. So all in all, 10 existing states, 11 targeted states right now. Our growth in case volume, um, I think it speaks for itself. Um, We've been, we were inhibited from a financial standpoint, a capitalization standpoint over 18 and 19. We still doubled from 18 to 19. From 19 to 20, we would have shown higher growth numbers, but COVID affected us as it did everybody else in the healthcare services environment in the United States last year. I know it did the same thing in Canada. And this year we're forecasting to exceed 17,000 procedures. And that is without any additional M&A in the second half of the year. And uh, as I've stated on earnings calls, I don't think we're done from an M&A standpoint. We're continuing to look for value-driven opportunities, again, in a highly fragmented industry. The one thing I, I am really excited about, as I look at the opportunities in front of us, are really entering the telehealth and telemedicine field. It's, a, it's obviously a growing field. There have been drivers for that. But in our world, it's really simple. We have a telehealth component now, it's remote. The neurology side of our business will continue to be remote. Uh, We built the portal, we built all the tools, but we were using contracting companies to really benefit from the scale. 
It's simple now. We're going to put our own employees into those seats and they will benefit from scale. We probably are paying any, you know, we think we can generate an extra five to $600 per procedure by bringing that in house. And it will have a significant impact as we go to 20, 30,000 procedures. And as our neurologists benefit from the ability to see seven, eight, nine, ten 10 procedures at a time. But further, this strengthens the offering that we're making to hospitals in inducing them to outsource to us. I believe over the balance this year, we'll continue to scale. We'll bring several thousands of procedures onto our platform, but 22 will be about rapid expansion and really monetizing probably the better part of 20,000 procedures on our own platform and then augmenting that with additional uh, other product opportunities, including EEG and EMG itself, uh, epilepsy around that, epilepsy services around that. I think there's a huge opportunity to build a platform to go after the hospitals directly. This product, again, reinforces the need for data analytics and, and leveraging data that we're building here. And uh, this is probably the most exciting thing that we're working on right now. It makes every part of our business more attractive. So as we look at new opportunities, M&A targets, new states, being able to generate and benefit from the scale of offering these neurologist services makes every new acquisition more valuable to us. And unless you're doing this as part of your suite of services, it's, it doesn't have the same value or the same ROI. As I look at the timeline for this year, in the first half of this year, we wanted to launch our services. We hired our first audiologist in March. He's doing literally dozens of cases every week now. Our second neurologist will start next week, and we have plans to add two more over the summer, scaling to about eight, ideally by the end of this year. The second half of the year, it's really about migrating as much of our business onto our own platform as possible. And next year, it's about expanding our offering to other interoperative neuromonitoring companies, hospitals, and ambulatory surgery centers. And there's always, there's always, always, there's always an opportunity to possibly buy someone in the space. And uh, we're obviously always looking for opportunities. But right now, uh, we're pretty excited and we're scaling. Recently, uh, we made our second key acquisition. It was Century Neuromodern out of Houston, uh, joint commission approved company, uh, primarily servicing Houston, but with footprints outside of that in the in the rest of Texas. Uh, and also in Kansas and Missouri. They did 5,500 procedures last year and uh, are projecting a similar number this year. Uh, we think they generated about 5 million of cash flow last year that we can outperform their numbers from an RCM standpoint. And as we integrate, obviously there are always opportunities for doing it with less people. You don't need to duplicate every staff functional area as you integrate. Purchase price was three and a half million dollars, 1.2 million in cash over time, and 2.3 in a sure stock. And the founders in particular want our stock more than the cash. Uh, we think it gives us tremendous upside because it really creates an additional 50 surgeon partnerships, 50 new facilities. It leverages our scale now. In Texas, we're probably going to do upwards of 8,000 procedures this year in that state. And so it strengthens, it strengthens our negotiations with potential insurers going forward. And as I mentioned, I think we can outperform them on the RCM side and realize we're already in Texas and we, are, we have already have a very strong feel for what we can get from a cash collection standpoint, which made this deal even better because we understand the market really well. Driving top line results, uh, as I mentioned, it's all about increasing case counts increase in collections, driving better results from RCM. It's about managing the existing pricing and margins and not being subject to downside on, on, the, on the revenue recovery rates. And we're recovering. A part of the challenge for our business is that we initially were out of network. Uh, we would do the work, we'd be paid later, but the amount that you accrued was really what the result of what you're collecting. So there was a constant uh, truing up and down based upon those accruals. Everything's changed over the last nine to 10 months where we've gotten much better. The average collections, I think when I started as CEO were 18 months, 
we're collecting at rates that are that are fractions of that now as we're automating. To give you an idea, 24 months ago, we were getting paper reports from third-party RCM companies. Everything's done electronically. All of our files are being downloaded and batched, sent to the payors. Any appeals done electronically, money's being sent via ACH. We've sped everything up to the point in time that nothing is paper driven now. It's all electronically driven. And I think we'll improve it significantly more as we continue to automate. And lastly, it's about in-network contracting. And our goal last year was to get to about 20% of our volume into contracts directly with the insurers or through their subsidiaries or related companies. We hit that number right now with the recent announcement this past week of a major deal in Louisiana, we're over 30%. And our goal is to get to 50 by the end of this year. And we're working on two large deals now that could significantly move the needle. Uh, again, the, the challenge in this industry, a, a big part of it is maintaining quality of service and being paid. And we have made those two the foundation of our business. The third foundation will be getting into the neurologist business and generating additional revenue and profits from that business going forward. Balance sheet, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, we have a fairly clean, I think solid balance sheet. We closed 10.5 million last year in our first institutional round of funding, end of November of 2020. Raised money through two institutional partners, special situation funds out of New York and Manchester partners, uh, really out of the New England area. We, rec we received 1.7 million uh, in an SBA loan draw. Uh, 1.2 million uh, will be forgiven. Uh, and we did a non-brokered uh, private placement last year, convertible debt, where we went out and raised some capital to do the initial NeuroPro acquisition. Cash flow uh, up 50% last year. Balance sheet uh, reflects all of our technical revenue. And we also have interest in probably s several dozen partnerships with our surgeon, which are all off balance sheet. About 56 million shares outstanding. 18 million warrants, nearly all of it priced at 78 cents US. Employee options are about 5.1 million. Convertible notes, if they convert in the 3.4 million, will result in 3.1 million uh, shares. Some performance shares that are just being issued now. At the end of March, we had 4 million in cash, 15 million of accounts receivable, other assets of 14 million. And we had payables of about 3 million. And debt, most of it bank debt, over 4 million of it bank debt, another 3.5 point five was convertible debt really leveraged against the the receivables that we have uh, so 34 million in assets and about 15 million in liabilities but a fairly strong working capital ratio management team uh, my I came on as CEO a couple of years ago uh, really to help turn the business around was going to be here in nine months I'm now approaching three years I think this is the best position the company's been in. Uh, key other hires that we brought on uh, it, on the on the team recently. Uh, John Price joined us as CFO. Uh, career with Ernst & Young, he's done multiple S1 registrations and has done NASDAQ uplistings in the past. Uh, Sean Blosser, our VP of Revenue Cycle, uh, was managing almost 800 million of billing with 400 employees for option care health, was able to recruit him away from a PE environment, uh, a, a very, very strong uh, RCM person. And we are continuing to upgrade the skill set in that team. Stephanie Krauss, our VP of, and technologist manager, she, 10 years of interoperative neuromonic experience, master's degree from Colorado State. And she's also on the board of ABRED, which is the neurodiagnostic credential and accreditation group, which oversees the neurologist uh, credentialing. Uh, she oversees all of our AD technologists. And Paul Webster, our VP of managed care, 20 years of experience in out of network billing. And he was VP of payer strategy at Air Methods. And I talked a bit about that company earlier. Strong background in healthcare, regulatory matters, negotiations, and MA activity. Preston Parsons, the founder, largest shareholder, and Alex Rasmussen, our VP of ops, who really has been here since I joined the company uh, in. in late 2018. The board, uh, 
Chris Romana, uh, a well-renowned neurosurgeon, former chair of the Tallahassee Memorial Hospital, a strong medical background, Martin Durian, a career banker with Canaccord, Haywood Securities. Like me, he's a CPA in background, also a chartered business evaluator. Steven Summer, former CEO of the Colorado Hospital Association, four decades of management experience in healthcare with Colorado Hospital Association, Virginia Hospital Association, et cetera. And recently brought John Flood on, uh, 35 years of capital markets experience, most notably as found, co-founder and chairman of Craig Hallam in Minneapolis. And John has been a shareholder over the last several years, uh, buying stock in the company, finally was able to get him to come on the board. So this is the board that we have right now. And uh, as we get ready to hopefully uplist for later in the year. That's it, that's my presentation. Would love to hear questions, comments, thoughts. Thanks, John. That was a great update and uh, congratulations. I know since you joined the company and um, the company's made a lot of progress over the last few years and achieved significant growth. So I think you've done a fantastic job at turning things or, things around. Thank you. Um, so we'll get into some questions now. Um, in terms of the organic growth, obviously there's a lot of opportunity within states and into new states. You mentioned some of the um, potential states that you're looking to enter, but in the states that you're currently in, where do you see the most growth potential? I think short term, we're, we're looking at some significant growth in Arizona and Texas, where we have, we're looking at multiple opportunities there. And obviously our, our home is Colorado, our home base, and we're looking at multiple new opportunities here as well. And uh, so if I'm ranking them, it's, it's really Texas, Colorado, and Arizona, where I think we'll see some significant growth over the next six to eight months in the states that we're currently operating. And you've already made some acquisitions um, in Texas. What's, what's the reason for the size of the opportunity there? Is it just the number of procedures or is it certain policies that make it easier for the company to grow within that state? Well, it's size of market. Uh, you've got major population bases in Dallas, Houston, and the Houston area, San Antonio, Austin. And it, it's really a, a medical hub. And we're looking at some significant distributor opportunities there, some significant hospital opportunities there. And uh, be, you know, with the momentum we've got, we've got a lot of other surgeons talking to us now about what we're getting done. And so it's part of its momentum in that market. Right, and a lot of the business is driven by referrals as well. A lot of our business has come from surgeons referring other surgeons. And uh, I think that's continuing to drive our, our business. Are there uh, many differences between uh, states in terms of the policies and reimbursements that each state would experience? Is that an added challenge for the company or is it pretty straightforward? It, it's, I'd like to say it's simple, but it's not. Uh, every state is different. Uh, and as we've gotten better at this, we've actually built the profiling and ranking of every state in the United States. And it, it's based upon competitive analysis, the average payouts of the, of the payors, uh, growth opportunities, and literally we have each state ranked from one to 50. Uh, the, the challenges in this market are that in some cases you have dominant payors that control 70 or 80% of the market. So if you're gonna enter that market, you better have you, you're, you better have a plan on, on with which to deal with that major payor, or you'll be facing, you'll be on the short end of a weekend of negotiations uh, with them. So that's a key, a key factor for us is understanding the payor landscape and how much we're gonna be reimbursed. And there's a huge difference across the states in the reimbursement levels. And the other thing that probably most Canadian investors don't understand, every state is different. Each insurer in every state has to operate autonomously uh, unless you strike a national deal because, because of antitrust competitive reasons, they can't share information. And so it leads to different pricing across all the states. And if you're entering a new state, would you be looking at that from an organic standpoint or mostly M&A? We've got multiple organic opportunities we're working on now. Uh, I think we're looking at two or three states new states that we hope to be in before the end of the summer. Okay, great. 
And I wanted to talk about the hospital opportunity because it's obviously a, a huge um, opportunity for the company. Can you elaborate on um, what your expectations are for uh, hospital contracts, uh, the potential impact of maybe a single contract deal and, and what that would mean for sure? Well, yeah, we, and we have, we're working with multiple hospitals now, smaller hospitals in Louisiana, uh, ex, et cetera, some of our smaller markets where we, we are the dominant player now. Our strategy going forward, and we've, we've created an outreach program where we have a team of people reaching out to every hospital across the United States electronically, email, contact information, et cetera. And it's really to create an event, let them know about our opportunity. And our proposition is very simple. We, we don't think they should be in the interoperative neural monitoring business. And we can show them a proposition where not only will they stop losing money, and nearly every hospital loses money on the interoperative neural monitoring and neurologist services, but if they outsource to us, they can get a return on, on their partnering with us in terms of a royalty and, and, a, and, a, and a partnering fee with us. We're in no less than three hospital discussions now. And I think over the medium term, this will be a significant opportunity for us, particularly as we add the neurologist services to our platform. And I can see us jumping from there into EAG, EG, and other services to really create a portfolio and bundle of services where we could be the solution of choice for neurologist services going forward. And what has your experience been in terms of the length of the sales cycle and, and what would you expect that to look like going forward with some of these hospital discussions? It's lengthy. And so you've got, and they're already in, they may be in contracts already with some of our competitors. They may be doing it themselves. Uh, we've had some success already, but I think it's, it's a longer term sales cycle than inducing a surgical center or a group of surgeons to jump onto your, onto your platform takes longer but we're but we're we're wedded to it and we're picking up some traction in terms of interest and negotiations that's great um we, we got a question from the audience asking if the reintroduction of obamacare would have any impact on on the revenue model it would um you know we don't see that happening right now at least it's not proposed um you know again Many have tried in the United States to dislodge the insurance companies, uh, the United, the Cygnus, the Etnus. Not many have had much success. And they're very embedded. They're very powerful from a lobbying standpoint. I think, uh, I think there's an opportunity for maybe a hybrid going forward, which I think is what's being contemplated. There are some proposed legislative challenges that are coming up in January around surprise billing. And this is a hotter topic right now than I think the Obamacare issue. The, the big issue in the United States uh, for anybody that's lived there is if you do have surgery or any type of procedure done, uh, either you're in network or you're out of network. If you're in network, the insurer tries to push you to a, a provider of choice because they have contracted rates they can manage their costs. If you decide to go to a specialist who's out of network, they'll only pay a portion of that. So it might be 50%, it might be 70%. And in many cases, those costs won't be disclosed to you until after surgery. I, I was on the unfortunate end of having surgery done in the US about 24 months ago. And I got a number of bills that came in that I hadn't expected. That's the surprise and surprise billing, where these costs can be in the tens of thousands of dollars. And what's proposed in legislation now in front of Congress and the Senate, and it looks like it's going to be approved, is that there would be an end put to surprise billing and limitations on it. And further, with respect to out-of-network billing, which is really important to us, there would be forced a forced arbitration process coming out of it, which we would we would look forward to because it will allow the it will stop the filibustering from the insurance companies in paying us. And that's really what Paul is focused on now, Paul Webster, which is you, and that's, I think, gonna drive additional contracting on our behalf to go in network because the insurance companies have always held the upper hand. They've got the deep pockets, the services providers don't, but I think it's gonna change in Q1 of 22 as this legislation comes forward and it will lead to an equal playing field. So 
that's really top of mind for us. We see this huge opportunity. So is there anything that you can do to prepare for, I guess, for that Q2, or is it really just getting ahead and being in front well, of that? Uh, there's a lot of work you have to be doing now. Uh, if you're going to arbitrate and you're doing, you know, 18,000 procedures times two bills, 36,000 procedures, and you're being slowed down and not paid, you better have systems in place to arbitrate those cases. And uh, so we're, we're working on that now. We're also working from a lobbying standpoint to be part of this going forward. And really, it's I think it's going to drive additional contracting. For those that have the ability to go into debt work, like us, it will drive additional contracts going forward. So we see this as an opportunity. But we're, we have a team of people working on it now. In terms of the numbers of procedures, we had a question emailed in about um, how many procedures your current infrastructure can handle. I'm telling our team to, to ramp up now to be able to handle 50,000 procedures. We're run rate this year. We're forecasting to be about 17,000, but our run rate at the end of the year will be higher than that because obviously as we scale, the first quarter is much lower. And then as we ramp, and the other thing is this business is almost a recurring revenue model. Whereas we bring surgeons on, if a surgeon does 300 procedures this year, he's probably gonna do 300 or very close to it next year. There's a predictability side to this now. But I think quite comfortably, we're expecting to be, we're, we're preparing to double and we'll, we'll double, grow by 80% this year, 70 to 80%. And we'd like to do that again next year. And so you've got to build your capabilities to be able to handle that. And as you scale the business, is hiring talent a concern? Um, what are the biggest risks to uh, scalability? Best teams usually win, whether it's in sports or business. So you're always in a race to find the best talent. Um, I think right now we're pretty happy that, that our, our starting line is pretty good. We think we can compete with anybody. As we get into telehealth, there'll be some, there'll be a need for talent there. And either we'll, you know, maybe we can acquire some talent through M&A. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll build it ourselves. I think from our core business, we're pretty, we're pretty happy with where we are right now. I think there'll be a need for talent as we jump into the telehealth space going forward. On the topic of telehealth, um, you, you talked about it a little bit, but um, what's your expectation in terms of uh, percentage of the business that's going to come from telehealth in the next year or two? Modest numbers this year as we scale. Uh, again, we're not looking to have a significant impact. It's more about learning, getting, being able to do it, deliver it, less than a few million dollars in revenue this year. But by the end of the year, going December, January, you're starting to really scale. And uh, we would expect each neurologist to do 2,000 plus procedures a year and, and generate a significant ROI because that's what our competitors are doing. The large players like specialty care and invasive are doing this at scale. Um, we would see doing the same thing. And we're already getting, even off our first, our first hire, we're getting numbers that are getting, we see that being attainable for the short term. So then it's about scale. And as you go from three to five, we think we can service eight full-time neurologists right now with our existing business. It's about scaling and getting there and then starting to throw, generate cash flow on the back of that. And it just makes the rest of our business stronger. It's net new revenue. And we're building a platform where we can market those services, not just for our own consumption, but to our competitors and the hospitals as well. And it sounds like uh, the implementation would be pretty straightforward and, and obviously be a large contributor to gross margin at scale. It's, so that's a great point. We've already built the infrastructure. We've just got contractors sitting in those seats. And uh, we believe we'll be able to generate a 50% margin and increasing with the efficiency of, of gaining scale. That's great. Uh, just shifting over to uh, the topic of m and is there a specific multiple or an average multiple, I guess, that you would pay for a business? We're looking for value. Um, you know, we're, I don't want to say we're, like we're there, there are two types of acquisitions we're looking at now. One is a, a straightforward multiple of cash flow. And the other, like Sentry, may be assets which are distressed and that have problems. And where we think we can fix them 
by migrating that business onto our platform. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to kind of telegraph what we think we can get assets for, but I can tell you what we paid for assets. We, for NeuroPro, we paid about three times cash flow for, the, for, for that business, which was not under duress at all. It was throwing off two and a half to three million of cash flow. So we paid seven and a half million for that business, approximately. And then in the case of Century, they were doing 5,000 plus procedures. Uh, good management team, solid people, 30 plus employees, 20 plus techs. But the problem that they ran into was RCM. It was the same problem that we had three years ago where they were using outsourced vendors. And they went through, I think it was three vendors in 15 months, which created a liquidity squeeze. And they're not alone. Uh, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, the healthcare billing is really complicated. And I think they reached the point where they just felt they, they could not take it any further. And they felt there was a bigger lift by taking the stock back in our company than by continuing to grind it out with their own business. And uh, so that business, we acquired, you know, 5,000 procedures, 5 million of revenue for three and a half million dollars cash over time stock. I think there are other deals like that out there. And so we're going to work through the integration of that business. It'll increase our volume by 50%. But I don't think we're done from an M&A standpoint this year. I think we'll, we'll be active in the second half of the year once the integration is complete. And are you seeing a lot of distress ass assets? What what would be the implementation time for some of these companies? And what would you expect in terms of the ability to um, achieve synergies with some of these companies that you're looking at? Depends on the size, complexity of the business. Uh, NeuroPro, four months of integration. Century, um, you know, we learned through that first acquisition and it's pretty much on target. We're, we're hitting the numbers we thought we would hit on that acquisition. And we paid for a significant portion of, of their own cash flow. This century deal, we're looking at probably a 90 day integration plan. It may be as much as 120, but realizing that deal is simpler because we're a competitor in the market. We already have contracts with the hospitals. We've already got contracts with a lot of the, the companies they're working with. If we were to go into a new state, and learn, it would take us longer. But because we're we're already a major competitor in that space, it's an easier integration for us. But 90 to 120 days. And has COVID changed, um, I guess, your ability to uh, find better, or get better multiples on the M&A side? Is, or is it becoming more competitive? Or, um, what are you seeing on that side? Well, I think for a lot of these companies that were struggling in the first place, uh, Tina, it made life even more difficult. Uh, a lot of companies last year benefited from the government funding in the United States, the, the CARES Act, the PPP loans, where that kept a lot of them above water. Um, but again, you know, for a lot of these mid-sized companies, they're undercapitalized. They don't necessarily have all the management expertise needed to drive the business. And RCM, if you can't collect money, it doesn't matter how good your service is. You're, it's going to be very difficult to survive. And again, we focused on making that our strength. So that as we bring these companies on, uh, we can drive a lot more revenue on the back of that. In the case of Century, they're using outside neurologist services. They're paying a seven figure amount to, for those services. When we bring that in house, and we're doing it now with them, we generate a 50% margin. That's our objective on that business. So there's an additional accretive income stream that we benefit from that hardly anybody else does as we look at m a targets. I do think the market will become more cluttered over the medium term here. There'll be a consolidation. I think we want to benefit from that. We're in a race to get to scale, but I think there'll be some other buying opportunities over the next six to 12 months for us. And looking at the business as a whole, are you comfortable on, um, giving long-term targets for gross margin and EBITDA margins? I'd like to say yes, uh, but you know, we've had some, there were some challenges in the past with uh, accounts receivable and out of network billing. That's, I think by the end of the year, we'll be able to give guidance because we'll have so much of our business in network where there'll be a predictable cadence to the average revenue per procedure numbers. I think right now, as you look at our, our technical margins, we're flirting between 47 and 52, if there are any write downs. On the professional side, similar margins. 
Where we can benefit though, is by adding neurologist services to this, where we can pick up additional margin and that margin will increase with scale. In fact, some of our competitors are getting over 60% margins on the neurologist side of the business. So as we complement and add additional verticals here, I think uh, to our existing business, it, it makes it more profitable, more sticky and uh, creates you know, a stronger business going forward. I have to ask this, and uh, we got a question in via email as well on, on this front, but you know, you've achieved so much growth over the last few years. You've really done a good job at managing the balance sheet. What do you think the street is missing right now? The valuation is obviously, it seems very cheap. I think it's, well, I think time will tell uh, for us. I think, uh, I think there's an issue right now around, we've simply got to execute this year. If we just stick to our plan and do what we're doing, I think there'll be a signal. I think, I think the market will reward us by the end of the year. I think part of the challenge we've had is, this is a US healthcare story, which is complicated. Trading on the Toronto Venture Exchange has added an additional nuance to it for Canadian investors. It's, it's difficult to explain how this business works, how you monetize it and the upside. I think as we uplist to a major U.S. exchange, and that's our plan, uh, I think that story will be better evangelized. And I think, you know, from my standpoint, I think you're familiar with the story. Uh, there were challenges a year, two years ago. This is the best it's been for our business. We, we see a huge upside now because we focused on building key competencies here where we can compete with anybody else in the space. And it's, for us now, it's getting the scale and just getting better at what we do. And I think I think it will be a strong year for us this year as we get into the second half of the year. I think the first half will be about continuing to build infrastructure out, getting Sentry integrated. There'll be some costs and some baggage that will shed in Q2. But in the second half of the year, I think we're in for a very strong second half. Yeah, I agree. I think the NASDAQ listing will definitely help out. It's it's certainly a story that I think will resonate well with, uh, with the U U.S market as well and U.S. investors. Um, we're coming up on the hour, but why don't um, you just give us a bit of a summary on some of the catalysts that investors can look forward to in the next 12 months and uh, more broadly, what you think the company will look like in the next two to three years? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've kind of given everyone on the call here an overview of what we do. Uh, that's not going to change. We are who we are. We're going to be focused on technologists and neurologist services. The key pivot for us, I see a significant migration, assuming our plan plays out into telehealth. I think we can leverage our interoperative neuromonitoring foundation to make a significant dent here in becoming a specialist in neurologist services going forward. And that's an important pivot for us. I think the other catalyst here, it's all about, I'm a broken record, collecting money in network contracting. No one else is doing what we're doing in this industry. And I think from a contracting standpoint, if we continue to do what we're doing and we're able to get 60%, 50% of our revenue into contracts with major insurance companies where we're paid in 30 to 45 days, the balance sheet and the cash flow just becomes so much more different than what they've been historically. And I don't see a reason why we won't. And we've had some significant wins for the last four or five months. Edna, major payor in Louisiana. And I think, that's not going to stop. We're, we want to be very aggressive. We're being aggressive on the M&A side. And uh, we're, we're being aggressive because, because we think there's a window here to grab a number of these assets at opportunistic prices. And uh, I think right now we're, we're not planning a capital raise in the near term. We, we believe we can strengthen our balance sheet, strengthen the value of our share price, and then have a discussion later, kind of post NASDAQ, maybe in the fall around whether we want to raise more capital. But certainly, uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's not on our radar right now, going back to the market to raise additional capital. Okay, okay great. Well, thanks so much for the update. Um, you know, congratulations on all the success you've had so far. And I know that this is somewhat considered a turnaround story, but from my standpoint, it's considered a, a story that has turned around. Um, obviously, you've You've put a lot of efforts into growing the business and, and um, fixing up a balance, balance sheet, putting a good management team um, and, and board in place. So congratulations. 
Thank you, Tina. I think there's a lot more to come. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks.